a comparison between Islam, Christianity and Judaism and the choice between them part 3. A glimpse of it which remains unchanged from the Torah. Informing about the emerging of a new message, a universal and final message. The Torah indeed did inform about the coming of the prophet of end times who will complete all of the previous message. They the Jews were waiting for his imminent emergence, this is why we find the Jews in the city the prophet migrated to Medina. But they the Jews were expecting that this prophet will emerge from amongst them the Jews or the children of Israel as many of the prophets had emerged. It did not occur to them that the prophet they were awaiting will emerge from not them but their brethren the Arabs, this is a historical fact. One notices that the Jews were tormenting the Arabs of Medina claiming that the prophet of end times will emerge and when he does they will fight alongside him against the Arabs. So when, eventually this prophet did not emerge from them but rather the Arabs who they had been tormenting this became too much for them to tolerate with and instead of believing in him they rejected him. Belying his call and turning people away from his message even attempting to kill him, but Allah was protecting his religion even if the disbelievers despise it. This also explains the eagerness of the people of Medina and their acceptance of Islam. As they had been listening attentively to what the Jews had been telling them concerning the imminent appearance of a prophet. So likewise the Jews had been waiting for three prophecies to come true. The first was the emergence of the prophet Yahya, John the Baptist, the second the sending of Jesus the son of Mary and finally the prophet of end times. However as was the custom of the Jews they killed Yahya, John the Baptist, and sought to kill Jesus and likewise rejected the message of Muhammad, but we shall discuss some of what remained unchanged from the entirety of the Torah. Firstly, what is mentioned in the Hebrew text? Matasu leo amawid wa leo amhaj yahud? Gehini haliko mozuid, misrei em takabasam muf takabrim mamad. Likus bambush brasham. A brief explanation of the meaning. What are you preparing for the hereafter? You the children of Israel were saved from a great tribulation at the hands of the Pharaoh and that Egypt will be their place of imprisonment, in an ancient city called Menath. As for the passage where the Prophet's name is mentioned then the meaning is as follows, that Muhammad for their wealth, that Muhammad will manner them in their financial affairs. And this indeed did take place when he sent the Jews of Banu Nadhir to the heights of Syria and to Khyber. The indication, the passage where the name of the Prophet Muhammad is mentioned, is independent of the verses around it, and cannot be regarded as anything but a proper noun. It is also noteworthy that the text remained unchanged for more than a thousand years and remained without any diacritical markings. Then eventually when they added these markings some were accurate and others not so. It should be noted that the word Muhammadim is also reported in the Torah and the suffixim is indicative of virtue and honor. It is also in the Old Testament the following passage. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command. Him. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 18. This text is from the absolute truths that indicate that this prophet foretold would not emerge from the children of Israel but rather from the brethren of the Israelite they are namely the Ishmaelite. Feasibly their brethren could only be either the Arabs or the Romans. The Arabs they are the offspring of Ishmael and he is the brother of Isaac and they are the children of Jacob. The Romans are the children of Ease and no prophet emerged from the Romans except Job, peace be upon him. Who was sent before Moses, peace be upon him. That leaves only one option that this prophet would emerge therefore from the children of Ishmael. The claim by some Christians that the prophet being referred to here as Christ is also not correct as will be made clear. A. Moses came with a complete law whereas Jesus came only to complete a previous law as is clear from the following passage. From Matthew 17:05, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. B. The station of Moses to the Jews is unlike the stations of Jesus to the Christians, especially when it comes to the question of the divinity of Christ. C. The Christian doctrine that Christ was crucified for the sins of man, this is not the case of Moses the Jews do not believe he was sacrificed for the sake of humanity and their sins. D. That the Christians claim Christ remained in his grave for three days and this is not what happened to Moses. And what is extraordinary is the blatant similarities between Moses, peace be upon him and Muhammad, blessings and peace of Allah be upon him. A. God Almighty speaks to Moses in Book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command. Him. B. Prophet Muhammad, blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, is like Moses, peace be upon him. Colon. I. Both had a father and a mother, 
and were born naturally unlike Jesus, peace be upon him. 2. Both were married and had children, unlike Jesus. 3. Both were accepted as prophets by their people in their lifetime, whereas Jesus was rejected by his people, as is mentioned in Revelations 1 to 1. The two were accepted by their people whereas Jesus was rejected. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. John 1 11. 4. Both besides being prophets were also rulers i.e. they could inflict capital punishment. v. Both brought new laws and new regulations for their people. And both were forced to migrate in the face of persecution, one migrated to Madian and one to Medina and both these places even sound similar. v. Both died a natural death, and are both buried in the earth unlike Jesus who remains in the heaven. c. Muhammad, blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, is from among the brethren of Moses. Arabs are brethren of Jews. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. The Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael and the Jews are the descendants of Isaac. d. Words in the mouth. Prophet Muhammad was unlettered and whatever revelations he received. From God Almighty he repeated it verbatim. So from what has been presented one can deduce that the Prophet mentioned could not be Jesus and was rather Muhammad because of the extraordinary likeness between the two. The prophet who shone forth from Mount Parnas in the following verse, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir, he shone forth from Mount Paran. Deuteronomy, 33.2, refers to the prophethood of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad respectively, upon them be peace. Sinai is the place where the prophet Moses spoke to God and received the Torah. Seir, a place in Palestine, is where the prophet Jesus received divine revelation. Paran is where God manifested himself to mankind for the last time through his revelation to the prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace and blessings. Paran is a mountain range in Mecca. It is mentioned in the Torah, Genesis, 21.19-21, as the area in the desert where Hagar was left by her husband Abraham, upon him be peace, to live with her son, Ishmael. The well of Zamzam appeared in it. As is stated explicitly in the Quran, 14.35, 7, Abraham left Hagar and Ishmael in the valley of Mecca, which was then an uninhabited place within the mountain ranges of Paran. The verse in Deuteronomy, according to the Arabic version published in London in 1944 and the Ottoman Turkish version published in Istanbul in 1885, continues. He came with myriads of holy ones, in his right hand appeared to them the fire of the Sharia. This verse refers to the promised prophet, Muhammad, upon him be peace and blessings, who would have numerous companions of the highest degree of sainthood. The fire of the Sharia alludes to the fact that the promised prophet would be allowed, and even ordered, to fight against his enemies, and indicates the opening of Mecca. Seir, therefore is a place in Palestine. Paran, refers to a mountainous region in Mecca. This is further emphasized by the following passage Genesis 21-21. He lived in the wilderness of Paran referring to Ishmael so it is conclusive that Ishmael lived in the area that contained the mountains of Paran in Mecca. This is again emphasizing in the following passage from the books of the Jews and the Christians. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba, Paran. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot, for she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is up. Lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. Genesis 21 14-21 And so after establishing that the boy in the story is Ishmael and the well is the well of Zamzam then it is certain that the wilderness being referred to here is Mecca and there is no doubt about this. Returning to the passage in Deuteronomy. The following verse. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir, he shone forth from Mount Paran. Deuteronomy, 33.2. This refers to the prophethood of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad respectively, upon them be peace. Sinai is the place where the prophet Moses spoke to God and received the Torah. 
Seir, a place in Palestine, is where the Prophet Jesus received divine revelation. Paran is where God manifested himself to mankind for the last time through his revelation to the Prophet Muhammad, upon him be peace and blessings. The Quran similarly mentions these three places Surah 95. Surah Al-Teen, the fig, by the fig and the olive. And by the Mount of Sinai by the city of security, by the fig and the olive, this is referring to the place where Jesus emerged. And by the Mount of Sinai, this is the place where the Moses received prophethood. By this city of security, this is referring to Mecca the birthplace of the prophet Muhammad peace be upon them all. Another verse from the books of the Jews and Christians that needs to be looked at with more detail is the following passage from Isaiah 12:29. it reads. Then the book will be given to the one who is illiterate, saying, please read this and he will say, I cannot read. The question is who is this illiterate prophet? It is without doubt referring to the prophet Muhammad, blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, who is well known for being unlettered, unable to read and write. And yet despite that he is Theon who imparted the message of the unity and oneness of God Almighty to the whole of mankind and taught all of humanity the best of all character and mannerisms. This is again another proof of the truth of his message. It is noted in the Torah that God proclaimed to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. Deuteronomy 18:18. 18, 18. It should be noted that the prophet whenever he read anything that was revealed to him he would prelude this by saying in the name of Allah the most beneficent the most merciful and every single. Chapter bar 1 in the Quran beings with this verse, and Muslims all recite this at the beginning of all their recitals. A description of the companions of the Messenger of Allah. In Deuteronomy 32:21, they have made me jealous with what is no god, they have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people, I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. There is little doubt that the verse is referring to the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, blessings and peace of Allah be upon him. Before the dawn of Islam they could not be considered a people or even a nation rather they were warring factions and tribes, with no leader or king. They lived in darkness and few among them were before the dawn of Islam they could not be considered a people or even a nation rather they were warring factions and tribes, with no leader or king. They lived in darkness and few among them were even literate. Compare that with what took place after the spread of Islam. Where they became one nation with a state and they went on to conquer much of the civilized world toppling great nations like the Byzantines. Despite this compelling proof some Jewish scholars tried to attribute the ignorance mentions in the biblical passage to the Greeks of old. This was in order to lead astray the idea that it referred to the Messenger of God Muhammad, blessings and peace of Allah be upon him, and his companions. History itself attests to the failure of this claims as we know how advanced the ancient Greeks were in their civilization. The Christian doctrine of the Lordship of God and how this belief manifests itself and how Jesus became divine. To them, one finds Christian doctrine littered with claims about God that are unacceptable for anyone with sound disposition or the least bit of intellect. And all of these claims are never backed up with any authentic evidence, that leaves the only explanation being that these are lies that have attributed to God and slander. One finds God is spoken about in their narrative according to their desires without the least bit of shame. It is claimed that God is one part of three parts or the doctrine of the Trinity the idea is that all three parts are interdependent on one another and yet all are gods. They are namely the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Ghost. The description of God being divided or part of a trinity cannot be attributed to God at all and is neither logical nor acceptable as God Almighty is in need of no one and is not dependent on anyone. To compound things we also find the Christians guilty of anthropomorphism, or giving God human attributes. They claim that the essence of God is seated upon the throne and that his son is upon his right hand side, and no doubt this is something incomprehensible for anyone in their right mind to consider. As Allah Almighty is the creator of place and is the creator of time and then how can we consider that it is befitting for him to be encompassed by his own creation? Allah is exalted above these attributions to him Almighty. One will likewise find, that the Christians also attribute to God what the Jews before them attributed to God before them like regret and anxiety as in Genesis 6. 6 and rest after hard work as in Exodus 17:31 and sleep and awaking as in Psalms 65:78, And screaming as in Isaiah 13:42. Similarly, the claim that God is like a blazing fire as in Exodus 18:24, and the likes of these are many. Likewise, one finds that the Christians attribute to God many sons and children, Luke 38:3. Exalted is Allah from the claims that he took a son unto himself. 
as has been previously mentioned, the Christians believe in the Trinity. Part of this belief entails one third of the Trinity being the Son. What is even more alarming is the claim that this son is of human descent and emerged from the womb. This son was then circumcised after his birth by a few days and was fed from the breast of his mother. In addition, he would drink alcohol as well as eat and would also need to urinate and defecate. These are all attributes unbefitting of the Lord, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Another contradiction with sound reasoning is the fact that this so-called son was in a state of worship and submission as is mentioned in the Gospel of Mark 35 1. The question must be asked, to whom was this son worshipping? As is logical, only the creation can worship and not the Creator. This is further evidence that the Christian belief is in direct contradiction with all logic and reason. What is more astonishing is the claim as previously indicated that this son would intoxicate himself with alcohol Gospel of Matthew 19:11 and Luke 34 7. These descriptions are unbefitting of a decent human being so how is it imaginable that it describes a Creator or a Lord or a God? No doubt this is another lion slander upon Allah Almighty. One finds that this so-called son was also led astray by the devil for forty days Gospel of Mark 13 to 12 to 1 and that this son would cry and become anxious, depressed and weak. The references for these are as follows John 35 11 Matthew 37 26 Mark 33 14 Luke 44, 32. They further claim that this son would be overcome by fear and flee and that he was arrested, bound and tied as is mentioned in the Gospel of John 1. 7 John 59 8 and John 12 to 13 17. In fact, the claims don't end there, it is claimed that this so-called son's face was spat on and slapped whilst being unable to do anything about it as was mentioned in the Gospel of Luke 63 to 64. 22, the Gospel of Matthew 27 26, the Gospel of John 22 to 23 18. If this was not demeaning enough, they then claim that this so-called son died upon the cross after being humiliated and tortured. This is all found in Christian belief. All of this is unacceptable for anyone with a sound mind to attribute to God. As for the third installment in this trinity of there then it is none other than the Holy Spirit Ghost. The nature of this spirit is so innocuous it provides the perfect ammunition for the atheists and disbelievers to attack the existence of God himself because of it. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, Luke 1 35. Can't you see that you are giving the atheist, the skeptic, the agnostic a stick to beat you with? They may well ask how did the Holy Ghost come upon Mary? How did the highest overshadow her? We know that literally it does not mean that, that it was an immaculate conception, but the language used here, is distasteful gutter language you agree? Language unbefitting to be considered the work of God Almighty by anyone with a reasonable intellect. It is also reported in Christianity that this Holy Spirit used to take the form of a dove as is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew 16. 3. And this is no surprise when you consider that they claim that this son is of human descent and emerged from the womb. This son was then circumcised after his birth by a few days and was fed from the breast of his mother. In addition, he would drink alcohol as well as eat and would also need to urinate and defecate. These are all attributes unbefitting of the Lord, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. All of these claims on God or His so-called Son and the third part of the Trinity being the Holy Spirit we have made mention of these claims and attributions all of which are wholly inappropriate and far removed from what should be attributed to Allah Almighty, and anyone with a sound disposition and an objective eye and any common sense can see this clearly. How does this false doctrine manifest itself? Christian missionaries and preachers alike call to the doctrine of the divinity of Christ and they do this in the following way. They say either Jesus is divine or that he is a liar or that he is a madman, it must be one of these three possibilities. But there remains one possibility that is not being entertained by those who like to follow their whims and desires and that is that he was a prophet sent by God and the miracles that were sent with him were given to him by God to prove to them the truth of his message. It should be noted that these missionaries always target the young, who usually have not heard or studied about Islam. The poor, who are in desperate need of assistance and food and who are given these in place of them becoming Christians. People who seek positions are given assistance in order to reach their target the only payment they are asked for is that they become Christian. There is no doubt that the Christians also use the media to further their goals and their belief. How did Jesus become God? It is well documented that citations of Jesus being referred to as God are not existent until the year 325 CE when the first council of Nicaea which was a council of Christian bishops convened in. Nicaea and Bithynia by the Roman Emperor Constantine in AD 325. 
Its main accomplishments were settlement of the Christological issue of the relationship of Jesus to God the Father, the construction of the first part of the Nicene Creed, which included the divinity of Jesus. And what is more astonishing is that had this voice faded into the background Christendom would still believe in the notion of the prophethood of Jesus, as is the Muslim position.